Mommy, Daddy, I'm still going to be queen of the zombie takeout, right? What's up? Welcome to episode 410 of Zombie Takeout, Take the B-Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get started, just for the record, I wanted to say that we are uh, absolutely 100% uh, in support of the protests, Black Lives Matter. Also, since this is our first episode in June, I wanted to say happy Pride to everyone. Um, also, for those who may not know, um, Pride marks the anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, which it really ignited the gay rights movement. I just wanted to put that out there. Oh, uh, also one last thing before we get started. Um, we're having some issues with the iTunes zombie takeout feed. Um, um it's not giving me um the download numbers. So if you're subscribed to that one, it would be great if you could subscribe to the John and Scotto feed, the one with both shows. Even if you only listen to zombie takeout, you can just ignore the hearing. Or I mean, if you like music, I, I think it's a pretty good show. Yeah, don't ignore the hearing. That would be terrible. <laughs> you know, if you like music, check it out. But if, it'd be great if you could subscribe to the app feed because then we can get the proper download numbers. It'd be greatly appreciated. Anyway, without any further ado, on to this week's movie, which is from 1988, Hairspray. This is our Jerry Stiller tribute. Right. We had no idea any yep. of this shit was going to go down when we chose to do this. I, we, I had picked this, I think, like two weeks ago. Whenever, shortly after Stellar died, probably the night I found out that Jerry Stellar died, I decided right. on this one because it was the only thing that he had a significant role in that was in our wheelhouse. Um, and I didn't, I don't even think I heard the name George Floyd until after the last time we recorded. And, uh, I mean, watching this in Chicago, mm-hmm. uh, man, this is one of the weirdest. One of the weirdest experiences we've ever had in this show, honestly, or I've ever had doing this show. Um, I can hear helicopters right yeah. now, actually. Oh, God. I mean, it yeah. is just it's so weird. Other end of the spectrum here. Um, all of the protests I've heard about in Jersey have been very peaceful. The cops have marched with the protesters, um, including the closest one in Tom's River, which if it weren't for COVID, I would have been at. Um, I've, I'm rarely proud of my state. Until now. <laughs> anyway, without any further ado, on to the impromptu plot summary. Sponsored by the music of the early 1960s. If you like songs and de- devoted entirely to describing how to do specific dance moves, and let's face it, who doesn't like those, then you'll love the music of the early 1960s. I honestly, I really found myself like bopping. Like, I forget how many scenes. Like, I loved the music <laughs> yeah. in this movie, and I did not expect it. I wasn't either. I was like, wait a minute. What, what am I, what's going on? What am I doing? <laughs> and also brought to you by the Hardy Har Joke Shop Dribble Glasses, Doggy Doo, and Silly Putty for under $3 in 1962 prices. Which you did, you googled? It's like twenty five bucks. Twenty five bucks. Yeah, silly funny. A joke that went completely over our heads. Probably just completely over everybody's head. I don't even know if Waters intended uh, it. Oh, I yeah, I was. I suspect like, he did. I was completely. I, I died when he said that, and the way he said it too. I was just about closing a deal for silly putty for almost three dollars. <laughs> Jerry Stiller. Oh man. Man, and, and I, you know, I didn't even look up like w- what work he did, like before and after this, because it feels like he didn't have much work before this, because well, this was like right by before Seinfeld. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say the Seinfeld was like ninety. Um, yeah, so this was right before Seinfeld. He did. He was a part of a, a comedy duo with his wife. In, well, right, in a long but I think ago. there was. I mean, there was obviously a dry spell. You know, well, yeah. Um, he did a John Waters movie. Love John yeah. Waters, but I mean, it's not exactly what he's known like for. Like a Tales from the Dark Side, an Equalizer, just like, yeah. He just also, like a... He also did like several concert, like little short films for Rush concerts. Oh, yeah? Like every tour, um, Getty did a short little tribute to him. Like for several tours, they had these little, they have, they have like little films they have between songs that were did. You know, their, their live shows were epic. And yeah. he was in several of them. You know, like each tour, they recorded a little thing with him for the middle of the show. 
Well, anyway, if you look at his work, like there's a lot in the 70s. And then like when the late 70s came, you know, Mm -hmm. there was the love boat Mm -hmm. and that was it. (laughs) Then it was just like little appearances here and there. And then Hairspray and uh, Seinfeld, which actually I thought ran 89 or you're maybe right. Maybe it was 90. Funny you mentioned Love Boat. Oh, yeah. Funny you mentioned Love Boat. I was recently thinking about that uh, that show, and I actually might do a revisit. <sighs> at least a couple of episodes. I know it's bad, but I just want a reminder of how bad. <laughs> I don't know if I could do that. I just don't know if I could do that. But anyway, uh, our impl- impromptu plot summary. Impromptu. Impromptu plot summary, mm-hmm. uh, which we did all the sponsors for. Uh, so we have uh, 1962 Baltimore. Um, there's... Uh, this is before the show American Dreams too, I think, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, because uh, that was the yeah, late that, '90s. I feel like, yeah, that, that that was that's right. I remember mid to late '90s. I remember a nun that I worked with was like really all about that okay. show. But but it's looking at those, and there were each city had their own Dick Clark, pretty mm-hmm. much, you know. Uh, um, I guess Dick Clark got beamed to the smaller markets, but uh, there, this guy wasn't real, but he's based off a real guy. Yeah, apparently, I have it in my notes. Uh, Woodard wrote the screenplay under the title "White Lipstick," with a story loosely based on real events. The Corny Collins show is based on real the real life Buddy Dean show, a local dance party program, which preempted. Uh, American bandstand in the Baltimore area during the 50s and early 60s. Um, <laughs> and Waters had previously written about it uh, on in his book, um, his 83 book, Crackpot, The Obsessions of John Waters. <laughs> so, uh, of course, they're teens. They love this show. They, they watch it every day. And uh, he has uh, different hops uh, where they just go. And uh, I, it, it really is a talent scout thing, kind mm-hmm. of, you know, when they find... Yeah. You know, fans of the show coming there to dance, and they see the best pick out the best ones to join the quote unquote council. And I'm sure American Bands did, did that, and I mean, even the grind probably worked that way. Yeah, why not? There's I mean, a flashback for my fellow Gen Xers. <laughs> I wound up meeting uh, DJ, uh, what was it? DJ Shaggy, I think was his name. Oh, God. Uh, yeah, I, w- I wound up working with him years, a few years after uh-huh. all that. Oh, wow. <laughs> Uh, another story <laughs> but anyway um he uh so so she well so they decide to go to one of these uh hops they they of course had to sneak out but it seems like that was a very easy thing to do mm-hmm. um and uh of course that that is the whole m- movie is this whole charmed you know she wants to do this she just goes and does it mm-hmm. and um our hero is of course um Tracy, who is a, um, I did get the name right, didn't I? Tracy Turnblad. Yes, Tracy. Um, and uh, she, you know, overweight. And so you think it's going to be disastrous, mm-hmm. you know, because uh, only skinny people get to go on right. TV. But uh, uh, the the carry pig's blood never happens. You know, That's one of the things I love the most about this movie because you you know it's going to be a body positivity story, which in 1980 was groundbreaking. But yeah. I love the fact that it's not overtly that. Her weight is never an issue, aside from some cheap insults that Amber, the popular girl, throws at her. It's just accepted. Right. You keep thinking the, the Carrie pig's blood is going to it's gonna come right over and get dumped over her head somewhere along mm-hmm. the way. And... Uh, or, or you kind of expect some sort of setback, like, oh, her mom made a deal with this other business, and mm. and you know the TV deal, of course, will it'll destroy her TV deal, and no, no, instead it just it all works out yeah. at the end. Yeah. Uh, the struggle, of course, because I mean you can't have a story with oh, uh, someone leaving a charmed life. Drama is conflict. The the of course the the struggle is uh, the show is uh segregated still it's the early uh, 60s is the early 60s and i read up about uh baltimore desegregation because i was like what kind of fantasia was this oh you did more research (laughs) than i did but uh they they were 
they were doing a separate but equal thing mm. in most Baltimore schools from the 50s. Uh, but because most color, you know, and white, mm. it, they they were, you know, segregated by neighborhood, mm. it didn't really come into play except for some schools like this, mm. where they did occupy the same building. They were integrated. Yeah. Slightly, though. They kept them on different tracks. Mm -hmm. Uh, and actually, it was Thurgood Marshall that was doing a lot of that did a lot of the uh, litigation in the fifties to try to seg desegregate. And, and you know, from my own experience, special ed is used for a lot of misunderstood kids. Um, in the early seventies, well, late seventies, I was the first kid, disabled kid, in my school who was mainstreamed. Oh wow! It wasn't in special ed, yeah. So, oh, right. and that was like a, you know, a decade or more after, a little over a decade after this. I mean, I, I think in like the 80s, it started changing more than anything else mm -hmm. and into the 90s. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the budgets, yeah. you know, that's a whole different story. <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh, it, it, it's a, a lot about the uh, treatment and desegregation mm -hmm. and uh, there's also an amusement park that was also uh, segregated at the time and so uh, our hero living this charmed life decides well that's just not right and uh <laughs> and, and without hesitation just joins the the chant and uh <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and um the amusement park bit was where it got the most chilling yeah. You know, I could understand how the amusement park bit under normal circumstances would seem funny. Mm -hmm. But while watching it in the middle of this was kind of, well, I'm not in the middle. I'm, I guess I'm kind of, I'm on the edge. <laughs> I'm, I'm a couple, I'm, oh, tonight, I'm <laughs> tonight I'm apparently a mile or so away from it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but, but last night, uh, you know, it was much further. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, so while watching it in the middle of that was, um, was really, it was upsetting, honestly, cause it's like, we're, you know, this is now, yeah. this, this is, I'm not going to say waters was prescient. I, I just think this shit's been going on for far too long. Well, exactly. That, that was the thing. Uh, I, I don't think he was prescient either. I, I think, you know, he wrote this looking back on mm -hmm. it changing, and this is history and something in the past. And instead, right now we're watching it yeah. and, and it's just happening all over again. And of course, um, she gets busted and sent to uh, reform school, which was always the threat as kids. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you got that to, speak to you, that threat of being sent to reform school. But I know it was uh, given to me. <laughs> and if Wendy O showed up in the reform school, this would have gotten a six. Uh, I mean, Rico Kasich and Pia Zadora were weird. Rico Kasich was. was one of the best, probably may have been the best part of the movie. <laughs> uh, and, um, yeah, I guess we could say hilarity and Susan yeah. at this point because it just all hell breaks loose. <laughs> and it opens with this song called Hairspray. It's this, you know, obviously written for the music, written for the movies, yeah. early 60s, written for the movie, early 60s style song. But it's pretty much some... the same as Cindy Lauper's Goonies song. And the vocalist, I know it's not Cindy Lauper, I saw a name no, on it's Wikipedia, not. but it sounds a bit like her. And there's something about the vocal, maybe the way it's recorded, same with the lead guitar, they just sound very 80s, even though they're going to great lengths to make it sound like a song from the 60s. Yeah, um, if you put it next to Cindy Lauper's Goonies song, mm -hmm. it is the exact same song. And I think there was a touch of gated reverb on the drums. Of course, it's the eighties. If you don't know what gated reverb is, do a search for it on YouTube. Um, and at this point, I have to admit, in those early first few scenes, Divine was really the only thing making it tolerable, <laughs> because I didn't quite click into it yet. Um, and then I noticed how campy it was. Like all of yeah. the acting was from like a cheesy commercial. Right, and and well, actually, I. 
from the start of this, I kept thinking of Charles Bush mm-hmm. and like yeah. the Psycho Beach Party, and just... well, I mean, Divine is practically a Charles Bush character. Yeah, the two of them never worked together though, did which they? Is, which is amazing, but I mean, it's it's the same shtick. Yeah. Um, oh, also when they got to you know the show, the Corny Collins show. Yeah. I, I couldn't help noticing that the guy from Sports Night who wasn't Peter Krause was getting a lot of camera time. Oh, you know the guy. They, yeah, the kids all looked very familiar. Josh Charles is his name. I, jo- I jokingly call him the guy from Sports Night because um, <laughs> Peter Krause was the only name who I remembered. I actually had to check um, IMDb. Um, turned out it was his for- his first role. Um, even and even though he only had like one or two lines of his own, um, he he was getting a lot of camera time in those scenes. Well, I was watching this on Amazon. I, you know, I paid the three or four bucks for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know how they have that x-ray where they show you the different people in there? Yeah. I thought there was something wrong because it kept saying Amber Von Tussle was being played by vitamin C. And I was like, oh, but vi- interesting. That's like, that's like the lady. That's why her name sounded the- familiar when I saw the credits. And yes, uh, this was her name before she was vitamin C. Okay. Colleen Fitzpatrick. Because I saw Colleen Fitzpatrick in the closing credits, and I'm like, that name rings a bell, and I like, can't remember why. Like, That's vitamin why. C did the graduation song, like, what, 15 years after this? <laughs> yeah. The fuck? And she was apparently only like, she's only she's like about my age, so she was only like 16 when they did this. Yeah. <laughs> Which she does not look 16. <laughs> and I loved, you know, they this dance called the mashed potato, which I think is an actual dance. Oh, of course, yeah, it's a, it's actually it's a well known '60s yeah. dance. I thought it had like and, more to do with the fists in the air, but I could be wrong. And then there was a, the follow up single, "Give Me Gravy." <laughs> <laughs> loved that. Personally, I prefer "Give Me Chocolate," but whatever. Um, I have to wonder if "Gravy" is an innuendo of some sort because "Give Me Gravy" was obviously written for the movie. They're all innuendos, though. Even back in the day, they yeah, were yeah. innuendos. I mean, come on, tail feathers? Right. Oh, yeah, shake your ass. Bend yes. over, shake your ass. Uh, I mean, twisting the night away, I mean... And I'm jumping ahead, but seeing I, Jerry Stiller in Divine... the twist itself. The twist itself was a euphemism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seeing Jerry Stiller and Divine doing the twist together was an image <laughs> I didn't know I needed in my brain. <laughs> but it was shortly after that you know give me gravy scene when i caught on to the acting style when when um divine comes in and is scolding them for having the tv on too loud and then it all clicked yeah I, well and that is like a sh- scene charles bush would have done too yeah <laughs> and, because and i think i did too <laughs> it's just this melodramatic commercial acting and I mean, like yeah. TV, you know, commercial ad acting um, that just sells the movie because Divine was so good at that. Well, what makes sense about it is that it is the acting style of the 60s That's rather true. than the 80s. Yeah. And so you you buy it because it's like, oh, you, you kind of forget you're in the 80s a mm-hmm. little bit. Right. Um, also, I, I have to say, I, I liked Amber's Vet. She's got this beautiful red 50s vet. Yeah, I'm not a car guy, but that's always the car that when I see that, I'm Same. like, oh, if only. If mm-hmm. only. If, also, uh, if Zombie Takeout had a TV deal, yeah, you know, you'd see that. us both driving I mean, around. I late 60s, like the Stingray. But yeah, vets. Um, <laughs> yeah. Also, Debbie Harry and Divine in what is basically a mainstream movie. <laughs> I mean, this well, was Debbie one of Harry the... did like a lot of TV work yeah, yeah, and true. stuff before in the eighties. But this is like main... Waters' most mainstream movie. Yeah, you know, and it, it's still subversive as fuck. <laughs> I mean, the pimple popping scene is the only thing that kind of leans into his older stuff, and that they right. pull away from. And that was very actually you know lightly done yeah they pull away from it oh by the way you mentioned amazon um i was gonna say something and i got sidetracked uh, i tried to watch this on hbo max i've currently got a, a free trial for a month um first off i am thoroughly underwhelmed by the selection on hbo max um and when i tried to watch hairspray the one thing that conveniently worked out with the catalog um it stopped about halfway 
a half hour in and and I couldn't get it to go again. I had to find another copy. I, I've yet to get HBO Max to work. And I think even John Oliver mentioned that on his show. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe so. <laughs> and I was like, oh, thank God. It's not just me. <laughs> It does not work. And, and I don't know why. To finally bring up the the guest of honor, so to speak, um, this is a surprisingly low key role for Stellar. Yeah, he, but he's just so charming. Yeah, yeah. He's not yelling, and I'm, admittedly, I mostly know him from Seinfeld. Yeah. So I'm used to him yelling his head off, and he's really kind of mellow in most of this one. Well, even like uh, King of Queens, he's still pr- pretty much playing mm. uh, Frank Costanza right. in-, in King of Queens, too. Right. It's just now he's somebody else's dad that right. yells. And I don't know what it is about the music in this movie, because I am not a fan of like early 60s dance music. M- you know, my joke about, you know, songs and t- voted entirely on how to do one specific dance <laughs> movie was coming from that place of, you know, annoyance. Um but I really enjoyed the music. Yeah, I think by the time we hit the Madison, that, that scene, mm-hmm. I, I just, yeah, found myself, wait a minute, why, why is the screen moving? Oh, wait a minute, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Although I have to admit that scene reminded me of a square dance. Oh, yeah. You had someone calling out the moves and everything. Right, right. I, I think there were a lot of dances like that. Um, and then we had, uh, we had actual... Uh, Record scratches. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also loved uh, Penny trying to say hello to Tracy when she was at, finally on the show. And, and Devine yeah. saying, like, she can't hear you. <laughs> well, the early days of TV, people... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it was just, you know, the divine, the condescending way Devine said that. Like, she, she, he almost patted her on the head. <laughs> um. <laughs> The high school set made me kind of tense because it was all too real. Like, I think it was shot in a real high school. It probably was because they actually shoot in Baltimore. Did you see what the actual amusement park was? No. It's uh, uh, Dorney uh, Whitewater Kingdom. Oh, okay. From Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I don't think I ever actually went there, but we, growing up, we we saw always, commercials all the time. We we see commercials. My parents never took me anywhere, so <laughs> there's no no way I went there. Uh, also, in in the school scene when she's talking to the principal, I, I loved hairdo detention. Right. She, she's sent to the principal because her hair is too high, and the students behind her can't see the blackboard. And and the principal, when she's when he's scolding her, says he's already sent her to hairdo detention. <laughs> And I was half expecting her to, you know, win him over with, oh, I just got a job doing this because of the hair and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And instead... Uh, he sends her to special ed. <laughs> he sends her to special ed. Which, in, when it, in the beginning of that scene, is very trauma. Yeah. I, I, I'm i sure Waters had, had to have watched some trauma to nail the beginning of that scene. Um, and we get, the, get a, we get a bit more trauma-ish with the riot, but we'll get to that. Um... I mean, really, he was just getting, um, I I mean, they're just, I've worked those classrooms where the kids are just like that out there and just like have to get it out of them somehow. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Loved the part, uh, you know, shortly after that, you know, when they had the sit in for the integration because um, her, um, the the daughter of this, you know, pop star, um, Motor Rap Mabel isn't allowed into this one hop because she's black. And so Tracy and her boyfriend stage this sit in to, you know, force them to integrate. And it, it just, you know, causes all kind of havoc and corny at the, who the host of the show at the end is signing off. Soon as he signs off, reaches into his back pocket, <laughs> pulls out a bottle and takes a swig and then hands it to his co-host. Very crusty the clown, although this is uh, almost before The Simpsons or mm-hmm. same time. And then the guy, you know, when they, they retreat to the, they, get, they end up in this black neighborhood at night, you know, dancing and, and you know, attending these clubs or you know, these, these sock ops, it, it dances. Um, and they, they step out, the two couples step outside, you know, to do what couples do. And, you know, as this, you know, Singer is singing his ballad inside. You have this homeless guy walking down past the two couples singing along with it. 
and singing <laughs> it just as well. Love that scene. The awkward makeouts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then we get to the beatniks. I fucking love that scene. <laughs> Piazadora and Rick Ocasek as beatniks. Piazadora was fun. But Rick Ocasek just painting in the background, just jumping around <laughs> wildly. It's probably coked up. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end, just taking the painting and smashing it on his head, like busting his head through it. Or at least acting like he was coked up. Who knows? Yeah, I don't know, I don't know um, Ocasek's history in that way. In, that sense. I, um, in a way, I think, he, you know, I'm not sure if many people do. I thought we never really heard much about him. Well, no, he, he was very private. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm t- kind of tempted to call this an, a long overdue Ocasek tribute just for that scene. <laughs> to share with Jerry Stiller, come on. Mm. Um, also, speaking of high points, you know, highlight performances, Waters as the psychologist, and psychologist in quotes, yeah. trying to brainwash Penny. And all the white boys in the school. <laughs> you would love to date one of them. Pen- Penny's mother is... Penny's dating uh, the son of Mutterath Mabel, a uh, black guy, and her, her mother is steadfastly opposed to it. She tracks her down at this, you know, club in, in a black neighborhood, and drags her home. And the psychologist is there, and he's got this, you know, spinning spiral. You know what I'm talking about? This, this you know, the, the it's little, a portable hypnosis, yeah, machine portable of hypnosis sort. sort of thing, yeah. Um, <laughs> And then he's got this cattle prod later. It's and it's Waters himself playing the role. It was both terrifying and hilarious. That's how Waters gets away with uh, portraying desegregation and the civil rights movement as he did, because he's already taking the dark, dark, you know, mm-hmm. psychotherapy horrors of the time and just giving like a kind of an elbow you yeah. know chuckle to that so of course he could do this other dark subject matter and still just be goofy and and weird about it right and speaking of dark then we get to the protest a protest over racial injustice with uh, white people inciting riots and police attacking protesters yeah yeah oh. Although when everybody started running after the fireworks were set off, it got once again very trauma. Right. That was just uh, I, you know, I could see how that could be humorous. <laughs> that that particular point actually was just mm. like, oof, yeah, huh. <laughs> and that's where Tracy's arrested. That's the one at the amusement park. Yeah. Um, and there's this bit where you know she she's in reform school and they show her boyfriend on um, you know the corny collins show in a wheelchair and she Gets starts better. and she starts making out with the tv <laughs> yes that was that was really weird there's a brief shot from inside the tv screen <laughs> classic waters we're ricky lake than i ever bargained for <laughs> Also, um, Amber's mother's hair with, just piled up with the bomb in it. They put the bomb yes. in her hair. It's like the this old like, like French, pre-French Revolution hairstyle. And why does Sonny Bono always got to be the terrorist? Hmm. That's a good point. Airplane, yeah. I'll um, take the bomb on the left, please. Right. Um, he's always got to have a bomb. Um, yeah. <laughs> And the little car after Amber won Miss Auto Show. One in quotes again, because it should have gone to Tracy, but she was in reform school. She's got this I little she like. Was going to get a, I thought the carousel scene was a foreshadowing of her getting sick. I thought that was what <laughs> yeah. was going to happen there. But she's, she's in this little like three wheel car, like toy car with this, you know, cockpit over it, just going in circles and circles. Also got a kick out of me, you know, at this point, they also, um, Mabel and her daughter kidnapped the governor. They handcuffed yes. themselves to him. And to torture him, they start kissing him on the cheek until he agrees to release <laughs> um, Tracy. Got a kick out of that. Oh, yeah. That was, I mean, there was just so much craziness going on at that time. It, it's, it was 
<laughs> if you know waters. John Waters, the last <laughs> acts tend to get a bit chaotic. Yeah. His last acts get weird. Um, she gets out of jail, and, and you, you simultaneously hear the Corny Collins show, and, and Amber, who is, you know, the, back to being the queen of the show, decides, calls out this dance called The Roach in honor of Tracy. And then, you know, once she shows up freed, she gets the title back. Literally, G thrones Amber. Um, she just starts doing a dance called The Bug. I got the kick out of that because the dance move was just like basically you know, trying to pat a bug off of yourself. Or having bugs in your yeah, you know, clothes. Like if you've or... got, you know, like you, you're moving like you have bugs all over you. Um, and then Amber's mom's wig blows up <laughs> because you know, they forgot to turn off the bomb. It blows up off of her head, lands on Amber's head, traumatizes her. Um, also, very surprised in the closing credits that Divine also played the racist TV show owner, TV station. Oh, owner. yeah. Well, he's he's easily recognizable. <laughs> I had no yeah, idea that was him. Yes. I, I think I think I was like a scene or two into it when he came of his. I was mm-hmm. like, wait a minute. Incidentally, this was Divine's final film released during his lifetime. He pa- he passed away three weeks after it was released. I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. Um, oh, and one last bit of trivia. Uh, Waters wrote that his all-time favorite review of Hairspray was David Edelstein's in, uh, the Ro- in Rolling Stone. Quote, a family movie that both the Bradys and the Mansons could endure. Could endure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> sequels and remakes uh sequels and remakes no and who did unfortunately this there is thing? there are stuff under sequels and remakes um in 2002 the film was adapted into a broadway musical of the same name which won eight tony awards including best musical of 2003 a second film version of hairspray an adaptation of the stage musical was released by warner brothers in 2007 and included many changes from the original I tried to read through the plot summary. No, thanks. Um, uh, and Travolta's it was interesting. in Interesting. I read this uh, article um, from Newsweek about it and how they were just not happy with how integration was approached. Mm-hmm. You know, it was kind of like, a, you know, they needed white people to tell them how bad it was kind of thing. That yeah. was the impression they got out of it rather than... You know, this one where it was the injustice was going on and, and yeah. they didn't like it, of course. Mm-hmm. And Tracy joins in. She not, used her privilege. Not leading it. Yeah. <laughs> not explaining. Um, Don't you guys realize this exactly, is fair? Exactly. <laughs> um, also, in this, on December 7th, 19, 2016. Wow, that was a weird slip. Um, uh, NBC aired a tele- television special event of the acclaimed musical. Um, I think I'll pass on all of those. I, I don't think I've ever sat through one of those live musical things. I just, uh, no. I watched Rocky Horror from a couple oh, of years ago. Oh, really? Um, I didn't hate it. Really? I mean, obviously I prefer the original, but I didn't hate it. But a network version of yeah. Rocky Horror, I just can't, I can't, I don't even understand how that, that could be possible. Actual Rocky Horror, the movie itself, is almost, aside from the nip slip and like one fuck, <laughs> Is pretty much TV friendly. But what about everybody yelling asshole? Well, it's it's everything that happens <laughs> in the crowd isn't TV friendly. That's where oh. the interesting stuff happens. <laughs> I'm talking about what's on the screen. <laughs> Take out the nip slip and the one fuck and it's fine for TV. You can't scream fuck that chin in front of the kids. You just can't. <laughs> well, that's the point of the... That, that's kind of the... Interesting part of the TV adaptation, and yes, we're getting super sidetracked. Um, of course. Because it, all of the stuff in the movie is pretty tame these days. So they can put it on TV. But all of the interesting stuff happens in the audience and in ours <laughs> in the lobby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, not on the screen. Anyway, well, it can't be all bad because uh, Christopher Walken played uh, Jerry Stiller's role. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I, I still think I'll pass. Yeah, honor brains. So, brains. This is an easy five. 
yeah, you know, I, I, I was trying to think of uh, a reason to not give it a five, but, but I don't think I can. It's just, it's a lot of fun all the way through. Yeah. It's, um, can't oh, be Jerry Stiller was actually in the remake too, is Mr. Pinky. I'm not even sure nice. what that is. Nice. The, the, the owner of the, uh, dress drop. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, I can't, uh, the, the music is just as contagious as hell <laughs> and catchy as hell. And, uh. And it's just a charming movie. So yeah, I saw this. I think I don't know if I said this on air. I saw this on TV like shortly after. You know, as soon as it got to TV, um, and I didn't get it back in the day. Um, and that's the last time I saw it before today. And if you had told me this, you know, when I got up today that this would end up a double five, I'd have, I wouldn't have believed it. I had never seen it before this actually, because I mean, it's just I mean, it's not really a movie that uh, right <laughs> in my you know <laughs> wheelhouse. I mean, it's something I would watch if you know <laughs> it's accompanying you know a date, right? But that just never happened. So, <laughs> yeah. but leave it to John Waters. Leave it to John Waters. Anyway, what Five did we learn? Ah, uh, well, we can't change the world's problems a day. For fuck's sake, can we do it in less than 500 years? Mm. And I learned how to do the mashed potato. Or was it the gravy? Or maybe the candied yam? I can't remember. <laughs> or how about the sequels, you know, like Twisting Again? Mm-hmm. Which, Let's Twist Again is an actual song. Yes, it is. <laughs> he made an entire career out of that dance. He, I mean, he he did, like, I don't know how many twists he did. Twisting the Night Away. I mean, they're they're all... They're all real. There was a Chubby Checker song referenced in the movie that didn't have twist in the title. I was amazed that he did I other think he things. did the Limbo song, didn't he? He may have, but it wasn't the Limbo song. It was some other song that apparently he did. Yeah. Anyway. He tried and, to do other things, but then when you're known for that one thing, yes. you just got to do it. Anyway, until next time, and we'll be revealing Best in Show. This will be our Fred Willard tribute. Always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. Thank you.